Uh, John Mark uh, serves with an organization called YWAM, which stands for Youth with a Mission, and he has an amazing, amazing journey. And um, I think that we would all benefit from the idea of a life transformed from basically not sure if he cared that God existed to absolute obedience and um, an exciting, exciting life. I wish I had half of the adventures that he's already had at his age. And uh, John Mark, just come and share with us this morning. Thank you for being here. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> These clear pedestals are awesome. Man, I just want to say it's so good to be with you guys. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of my story this morning as I became, you know, a full-time missionary because it wasn't necessarily my ideal plan. Um, but I just want to say it's awesome. I grew up in the Presbyterian Church. My dad's a Presbyterian minister, so it always feels like home um, being in the church. And so it's just such an honor and a privilege to be with you. And um, so I'll just kind of get into a little bit of my story, my journey uh, of how I got to where I am now. So uh, like I said, I grew up in a, a Christian home. My dad is still a, a Presbyterian minister. He's been an interim minister um, kind of his whole career. So his, his life has been about going to a church as they find a full-term pastor and, um, and just being a part of some of the craziest broken churches that I've ever seen. Um, and he's just really stuck with it. My dad's a, an incredible man after God's heart, and I just am so honored to call him my dad. Um, but growing up in a Christian church and having a dad as a pastor, you might have heard stories of preacher's kids. And um, I was probably about as bad as you can get as a preacher's kid. And I was telling this to John last night. I have a, an older brother and a younger sister that we adopted from Romania. My older brother was that perfect kind of pastor's kid, you know, the one that knew all the Bible verses and everybody, you know, would go to him and say, well, you know the answers, preacher's kid, what is it? So I was like, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the one who knows all the things. So I kind of made it a point to my probably harm of not being the guy who knew all the Bible stories and, and trying not to be the guy that was called upon because I didn't want to have my, what I kind of found out later, my identity be made inside of something that wasn't me. I kind of wanted to make my own mark in life, and uh, I did a pretty good job of doing that the wrong way. But I want to start off also by reading this verse out of Luke 6, 43, that'll kind of tie in this whole thing that I'm talking about today, um, and what I've kind of titled, Friendship with Jesus that Transforms into a Life of Missions, because I believe that we're all called to be mission-minded in helping people understand their identity and their intrinsic value in Jesus. So uh, in Luke 6, 43, it says this. <clears throat> no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of evil stored up in his heart. For from the mouth speaks the heart what the heart is full of. And so I want to share with you some stories of my life of how maybe there were some times that I walked in a place of my heart being stored with things of the world and evil and how God really transformed that. So moving forward, um, I was raised homeschooled. Um, so if you know anything about homeschool kids, they're kind of weird. I think I turned out okay. Uh, we kind of, I can say that because I was homeschooled. Um, uh, but there's, there's something about homeschoolers, you know, I don't know what it is, but, um, I was raised homeschool up until I was in eighth grade. In eighth grade, I went into public school. I was really excited about it. I thought this was going to be awesome. As a homeschool kid, I'll tell you this, I was pretty cool. Um, I, you know, I was a little bit cooler than some of the other homeschool kids. So when I went into public school, I was like, man, I got this in the bag. This is going to be easy. So I go into eighth grade and at that time I was really into skateboarding and back then, they didn't quite have the clothes that they have today. So I would wear girl jeans. Here's why. They're a little bit more stretchy. So when I would do tricks on the skateboard, it was a little easier to do. Um, and I also wore just, you know, casual T-shirts, maybe little stick figures and printed on it. I mean, guys, this was the early, this was a long time ago. And, um, <laughs> you know, and I, I felt pretty cool about it. So I'd go into school, and I would start introducing myself. Hey, guys, I'm John Mark. I'm the new kid. And they'd say, wow, John Mark, two names. That's a lot. I grew up in the South, so it was kind of common to have two names, but not super common. 
And so, yeah, so I, I would introduce myself as John Mark, and they'd say, well, um, that's kind of weird. You have two first names. And I'm like, well, the last thing I want to be is weird. I'm just trying to fit into this place. And then people would start to say, um, man, you kind of dress weird. I was like, man, I don't really want to dress weird. So I went through this whole thing, right, where you can see on the screen, I, I had this massive identity crisis where I was really quite confident in who I was as a person. And then all of a sudden I go to eighth grade in the public schools and now this whole idea of the world is trying to define what is really popular and cool and exciting. And I was like, oh man, I just want to fit in. So from eighth grade on, I changed and started just going by John. And I got rid of the girl jeans and the stick figure t-shirts and started wearing, at the time what was really cool was like Hollister and Abercrombie. And uh, where I was, you know, you had flip-flops, and you'd kind of sag your pants a little bit, and you'd tuck the jeans under the flip-flops, and that's how you knew you were cool. And so I was like, Mom and Dad, I got to get, I I can't be wearing these Target jeans. And they're like, why? And I'm like, you just don't understand. So I wanted to fit in, right? So I started having this massive identity crisis that continued to lead on all through high school and into college of trying to make what I thought was the right steps in life based off of what the world wanted. To become cool inside of the world's eyes was to have nice things, to dress a certain way, to have certain kind of friends, and to have girls that liked you, and to be invited to all the parties, and While I ended up finding myself in a lot of that, I also found myself being quite bullied through high school because people are just mean. And I always felt like I was just never enough. The more strides that I would take, it just kind of continued me in this pursuit of being like, I have to be better than I currently am. I have to find myself more adapted to this world standard um, than what I currently am right now. And so as I started going through school, yeah, that really took me down to a life of a, a lot of parties and alcohol and, and a lot of things that you might hear people getting caught up in. But for me, it was like deeply ingrained in this idea of identity, of like, this is really what I need to be. This is what I need to be in pursuit of, um, which was really rough and destructive. Um, and at the same time, I had started falling in love with this idea early on in high school, or I guess right before high school, of the medical field. And so I had gone through all of high school and prep schools to become what I ended up wanting to be was a cardiologist or a heart doctor. And so all through high school, uh, when normal kids would take electives, I was this nerdy kid who went to prep schools and all my electives were medical. So there were extra anatomy classes and biology and chemistry. And I started shadowing a lot of doctors and my entire focus was like, I wanna become a heart doctor. Um, so uh, we privileged to have a cardiologist in our church. So I would shadow them all the time. So I was like, okay, I'm living this worldly life. This is what I want to do. I'm going to fit into this area, but I also really want to become this heart doctor. So that's going to work out really great for me. So I started wrapping my entire future focus on this idea that I'm going to become a cardiologist and kind of can do what I want. Um, As I start going into um, college, uh, I had just finished high school, top of my class, which is interesting because I'm dyslexic. So God just really worked out on that, even though I wasn't walking with him. And uh, I also was working as an EMT. So I worked uh, in the ERs and in in the hospital um, and also in ambulances. And then I started going to college and doing all of my my prep work to go into med school. Um, And so what ended up continuing to happen, though, is I continued to live worldly. I was really lucky enough to have really good paying jobs. I really wanted and desired to not have any student debt. Um, and so I, I paid cash for all of my school. I had no scholarships, and I was able to put my way through school. But again, it was wrapped up in this whole worldly identity that I was making everything happen myself. I was paying my way through school. Again, I had really good friends, really good as in worldly. They were actually really bad friends. And through college, I got really wrapped up in party drinking, ended up getting into a lot of drugs, and it was just really going downhill. Um, I also worked uh, in a lockdown unit with Alzheimer's and dementia patients because I wanted a broad spectrum of being able to be relatable in my patient care. And um, and there's this thing that I call lucid moments. And if you guys have seen The Notebook or if you've had family members, you know what this lucid moment looks like when somebody who's struggling with their mind deteriorating in one of the saddest diseases known to man comes back and has these moments where they can relate like nothing changed. 
And so I would say in my journey, I would say there's moments in my life where I had these lucid moments, where I didn't walk with the Lord, even though my parents are phenomenal Christians. I can say you can never wrap your personal identity in Christ up in somebody else's walk with the Lord. And so no fault to my parents, but through my journey of knowing God but having no relationship with God, I had these moments where God would show up in my life and remind me that he was real, even though I didn't always live for him. Or really at all until I was much older. And so one of those moments was uh, I was living in North Carolina, going to college, and my parents at the time were living in Florida at a church almost identical to this. I was just telling Casey last night, the church that my dad was a pastor at was a Presbyterian church, and it literally looked almost identical to this, and it got struck by lightning and burnt to the ground. So whatever they, whatever they were doing, God really um, showed up. So uh, <laughs> these old wooden beams, they go quick. So just make sure you're praying hard. But um, he stayed with that church through the whole rebuild process, even though it was a really, really tough church and they really didn't treat him very fairly. So when he moved on to another church in Fairhope, Alabama, I said, hey guys, I'll come help you move. So we did this awesome little road trip and stayed at some campsites of America, KOAs, and had an awesome time. My mom said to me, you know, John Mark, why don't you, um, you know, my mom never changed calling me John Mark as a good parent would. Um, she's like, that's not who I named you to be. That's not who you are. And you know, the great thing about being John Mark, I'll side tangent is, you know, I get into this family with all these Johns, but I'm the only one who leaves a mark on things. So <laughs> I'll say that. Um, you liked that, didn't you? I know. That's good. <laughs> So anyway, so we go through this, and my mom said, you know, John Mark, why don't you consider moving to Alabama with us? And I said, that's a horrible idea. Uh, why would anybody want to move to Alabama? I actually love Alabama, so it's okay. But, um, but I was like, I'm, you know, I'm in school. I, I have a good job. I'm working. All, things are going pretty well for me. Um, you know, since I grew up in North Carolina, that seems like home. I moved away at 17 and lived in South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Um, and so I was like, I really wanted to be back in North Carolina. So she's like, you know what, John Mark, sometimes missionaries, they'll pray and they'll ask God three things, but they won't tell anybody. And then if God answer those three things, then they'll know that they're supposed to do what they ask God to have three signs to show up. And I'm like, this is my worldview, guys. I was like, what in the world is somebody in Africa uh, as a missionary, that's all I thought missionaries were, right? I, just forgive me. I was like, what is somebody in Africa as a missionary going to ask God for three things? Okay, maybe they want a nicer bed so they're not sleeping on the ground. I have no idea. But whatever they're asking, okay, we'll see. So I was like, all right, well, I'll make this pretty practical. I won't tell anybody. If I was to move to Alabama, I would need to get straight into, you know, a college that had a good medical program and have no out-of-state tuition. That would be really great. I'd need to get into a job and, you know, have a, a job right away. And, uh, and I'd need to have, the first car that I bought was a Porsche 944 restored, and I drove it off this little embankment late at night. It was pitch black, and uh, I got a hole in the gas tank, and it was going to cost $3,000. And I was like, I need to get that fixed. So sure enough, the dean of students at Faulkner University was at my dad's church, and he said, hey, why don't you come tour our facility? We have a pretty cool med program, and we could get you in out of state. wouldn't even be a problem. I was like, this is crazy. At the time, I was also working in sales, so I worked in the same company that I walked in, and they said, we would hire you right now on the spot if you lived here. And I was like, this is crazy. So I was like, okay. So I get on a flight, and I'm flying home, and I'm like, thank God, my Porsche didn't get miraculously fixed out of nowhere, so I have to move to Alabama. My mom calls me on the phone. She goes, hey, I, I talked to this guy because I know it's really expensive for you to get your car fixed. I told him that you know you're a young guy putting his way through school and that you have this exotic car and everything's so expensive. And he said he'll come pick it up on his flatbed, take it to a shop, and fix it for $300. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, dang it. Now I got to move to Alabama. Because while I didn't believe in necessarily the understanding that God was a God of relationship and wanted anything to do with me, I never doubted his existence. And I was like, clearly God's moving because I can't really deny this. So the last thing I want to be is, you know, a, a God, a, you know, a guy who gets smitten by God for being disobedient. You know, just remember, it just come out of this church burning to the ground. The last thing I wanted was to get struck down and burned. So I was like, okay, two weeks, moved to Alabama. So that was, again, just this moment of, um, a lucid moment of God showing up in my life. 
And uh, in that time, um, things were going really good. Um, got right in, and I was in classes going into my last year. And I remember driving home, and I can say this pretty clear with understanding now that I didn't know it at the time, but God took away my passion for the medical field. And I remember driving home, and all of a sudden, I felt empty, lost, and I had no idea the direction of my life. What am I going to do with my life now? Everything that I have really created and wrapped my mind and understanding around was this pursuit of the medical world, that I'm going to do this, and it's going to be great. And uh, so I go home, and, and, I, uh, and I'm just trying to figure this whole thing out, and I ended up praying with my mom and dad, and my mom said, you know, have you ever thought of YWAM? And I'm like, I have no idea what YWAM is. And they, she was like, well, it's this mission school thing. You go for three months, and then you go on outreach for three months. It's called a discipleship training school, a DTS. It's the entry into this mission called uh, YWAM, Youth with a Mission. I was like, yeah, I have no idea what this is. And she goes, well, you remember those two twins that you did homeschooling stuff with? And I was like, no, not them, Mom. <laughs> and um, guys, you, you just put yourself in my shoes for a minute. Really worldly, had created my entire life around all this stuff to be what the world would deem cool. I mean, I drove a Porsche and paid my way through school and was doing really well, lived on my own, all this stuff. And then she's saying that, you know, I should go and be like these two girls that were kind of like Mennonites and had, you know, dress skirts that were made out of jeans, probably an inch past their ankles. And I was like, mom, that's just not my crew. That's not my crowd. I, I have, that just doesn't seem like me. But I was, I was desperate for something. I felt lost and empty. And I remember growing up, I would hear these stories of people that were like, okay, God, I'll give you a chance. And if you show up, I'll give you my life. And then I'd hear that God showed up and they gave him their life. And I'm like, okay, I don't know what that looks like, but I wanted to start making bold statements. So I was like, okay, God, if you're real, like not real as in you created the earth, but if you're like real as in you want anything to do with me, I'll give you a chance. And if you show up, I'll give you my life. And then I also said in this whole process of just being bold with the Lord, Anything you say to me, I'll just do right away. Because I'd always heard from my mom, you know, uh, son, uh, partial obedience is disobedience. And I was like, well, definitely don't want to be disobedient to God. To God. So I was like, okay, if you, if you show up, I'll, uh, I'll give you my life. And, and if you say anything to me, I'll just listen and respond to it. And so uh, I started looking at YWAM schools. If you're not familiar with Youth with a Mission, it's the largest young adult sending mission in the world. We have over 30,000 full-time staff that we know of. It's probably almost double that because we're in almost every single nation on earth. Uh, And we have DTS or discipleship training schools, which is the entry level into youth of the mission in almost every nation on earth, if not multiple um, training locations around the world. And so I spent seven days and I looked at every English speaking DTS that was run. And I said this at the very beginning, God, if you want me to go and do a DTS, you're going to have to speak to me and tell me where to go. I was like, I'm off the hook. If God doesn't speak to me, I don't have to go anywhere. This is awesome. Didn't necessarily help my lack of future projection, but I was like, okay, you got to show up and speak. So, uh, so on day seven, seems fitting, the day that God rested, it was the day that I could rest. It was uh, God... Um, God showed up, and as I was scrolling through the list of all the locations of the countries, they were just written in red, and while I was really good in science and math, I was absolutely horrible at geography, and so I really didn't know anything. I mean, Africa could have been its own nation for all I knew, and so as we were scrolling through the list, there was Belize, and I didn't know where Belize was, so I clicked on Belize, and it was called Destination Paradise, and as I clicked on Belize, um, as it was unloading, like as the page was loading, I remember God spoke to me so clearly in my chest. I don't know if you've ever heard God's voice audibly. I've unfortunately never been able to hear him audibly, but I hear him very resoundingly in my chest. It's something I can't mistake. And God said, you're going there. And I just remember going, okay, I'll go. Again, I, I didn't, want to, um, didn't want to respond in a place of disobedience. And it started me on this journey for the first time of starting to understand what does it look like to walk in obedience that leads to blessing. And when we walk in obedience with the Lord, his desire is to bless us because he's a good and caring father. We can read in in the scriptures where it talks about uh, what son asks a father for bread and he gets given a snake. God God is a good father and he gives even better gifts. And so this whole thing of responding in obedience and God coming out with blessing, it was perfect. Belize ended up being the best place for me. It was 
right on the ocean on this little island just off the shore of, um, of Belize. And it had scuba diving and spear fishing and sailing on the second greatest uh, barrier reef. And here's a picture of our dock. And so I say, okay, God, I'll go there. I'll do that. What came next was some of the darkest time of my entire life. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but when you're walking in obedience with the Lord, there's nothing more dangerous to the enemy than that. And he threw every single thing at me to try to derail me. I got more addicted into things like social drinking and alcohol, started trying harder drugs like cocaine, and uh, many times would drive my car drunk and ended up crashing. The enemy was on a mission of destroying the trajectory of my life of saying yes to Jesus. Luckily, I wasn't um, thwarted in that time, and I ended up landing on this amazing island just nine months later. And I can remember vividly stepping on the dock that's furthest out into the ocean, and when I stepped on that place, I remember going, man, my life is never going to be the same. I don't know if you've ever been in a place where you can feel the presence of God so thick you could cut it with a butter knife, so they would say, but that's how it was for me. And God was just after changing my identity in him from someone who was broken and made in the world to starting to understand what does it look like to be a son of the king of kings right before i left to go on that trip i remember i was sitting at a campfire and um, with some of my really close family friends and right in that moment again i heard this resounding voice in my chest and it was the lord and he spoke to me and he said son i want to give you a moment kind of like saul turned to paul but I don't want to change your name. I want to take you back to who you were before you lost your identity. I want to call you John Mark again. And so I changed my name because for the first time I started realizing that while I tried so hard to find my identity in the world, God never lost hope in me. He never lost hope in the trajectory of what he was doing in my life. And it all started to make sense. And I get on this, this island and started doing this school. And I was so desperate for a real presence of God. And I'll share a story with you about this doc. One night late, I went out there and I was just desperate to experience him. So I remember I kind of walked out to the end. If you can imagine that doc, if you see it, imagine it being pitch black. There's no lights out there except this one little light kind of in the right-hand corner. And I just felt this invitation from the Lord to ask that he would encounter me. And, and so I said, God, if you really love me, would you send me something like maybe some kind of like marine life? I don't know. Something so I know that you're with me and you really love me. So again, I hear this kind of voice in my mind and it's like, John Mark, I want you to go to the corner of the dock it's to the left side. And I'm like, that makes no sense, God. There's one light here. How am I going to see anything? So, but again, I was like, all right, I just want to be obedient. So I go over to this corner, and I go, okay, um, now what? And he's like, all right, I want you to close your eyes and count down from 10. I'm like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done, ever. <laughs> but the cool thing is, it's like 1 in the morning, and there's nobody to see me. So if this is a total failure, who cares? So I was like, okay, fine. So I close my eyes. I start counting down from 10, get down to 1. And I pause for a second, and I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. And I open my eyes instantaneously out of the darkness, three eagle rays come swimming out of the ocean. This is what an eagle ray looks like. It swims so close to the surface that one of the wings almost touches the dock as it goes by me. Some of the most graceful um, rays I've ever seen in my life. And three swim right by. I could have reached down and touched them, but I was so shocked and so overcome. And I started to weep. And God said, my son, do you not know that if you asked me to show you that I love you, that I wouldn't send anything. So again, I just have this moment of encounter where God shows up and meets me in my heart's desire to continue to remind me that he's after my heart, to start to restore this broken identity that I've made in the world so I can start understanding what does it look like to start walking in my identity and relationship with him. After I do this DTS, I start asking God, okay, what's next? And he said, um, I want you to do this for the rest of your life. And I said, well, that makes sense because my whole thing was I need to find identity in the world. And if you can change my broken identity, I want to give you the rest of my life so I can help other people know who they are in you and the, the specific gifts that you've given them and how they can use that to expand your kingdom. But I really knew that I didn't know the Bible, like I said. I you know, wasn't the guy who knew all the Bible stories. So I was like, I need to do a Bible school so I can learn about God's word 
and so I can, uh, you know, have a better idea of, of what you actually say. Because I, now that I'm starting to know you, I actually want to know what you have to say about things, and I need to get into the Word of God. And you probably can agree that this generation, this younger generation, is massively deprived when it comes to the area of knowing the Word of God. A statistic says that Christians, in general, 1% of them know the, the story from Genesis to Revelations in its overarching story. Not all the scriptures and all the stories, but just the understanding of what happened from Genesis to the creation of man to the redemption of God through Jesus into what's coming in Revelation. One percent of Christians. So I'm like, man, I got to know the, the Bible better. I got to know what God actually really says. So uh, I ended up going on this school. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, on this boat, this awesome sailing boat where I sailed and read the Bible for six months on location. Cyprus, Israel, Turkey, Greece, Malta, and Italy. And um, it was one of the most phenomenal times because I was able to read the word of God where it was written in many of its places, especially the New Testament. And it changed for me everything. So now when I crack open scriptures and I'm reading any of the letters that Paul wrote, I'm like, man, I remember standing right in a similar area to where that was. And for me, it just made the Bible come alive and it made God's word come alive in a new and a fresh way. So after that, I said, okay, God, what do I do now? And uh, he said, I-, I was looking at all these places. I really wanted to travel the world and I, I felt like I had this heart to-, to travel and see the nations of the world, to see the unique fingerprints of culture and to help uh, people start to understand their identity. And so I, I had this idea that I was going to travel through these DTSs that every month go to a different country. I was like, that's what I'll do. And God's like, no, I want you to go to, I want you to, go to Kona, Hawaii, to be a part of Youth with a Mission there, where they're sending boats out to the Marshall Islands. Kona, Hawaii is a strategic location because it's one of the most, it is the most isolated places in the world as, geographically as far as getting to another location. And I was like, um, okay, I don't know if I want to go to Kona, God. I don't know if you know this, but it's really hard to be a missionary in Hawaii because nobody wants to support a missionary in Hawaii. And if you don't know, every single person in the organization of YOM is fully funded so by individual supporters. Um, from the low person coming in doing a DTS to the co-founders, Lauren and Darlene Cunningham themselves, there's no paycheck, there's no retirement, there's nothing. You pay your way, you pay your food, you pay your housing, you pay your flights. And that's just how we've set up the organization. So it's always based off of obedience to the Lord and not off of finances. And I'm like, okay, God, that might be a little difficult. But again, I don't want to be disobedient. And also, the, they're only going to one location. So that doesn't make any sense to me. But I guess I'll give you my yes for two years. And I'll go there and I'll go to one country when I feel like you're calling me to go to many. And friends, I'll tell you this desire of my heart to travel the nations. God has honored that. And I've now traveled to 129 nations of the world. Um, because of my simple yes to always say yes to the Lord. I haven't planned a lot of these trips. It's just God is honoring of the desires of our heart. So I go to Hawaii and um, I end up getting changed and we get sent on this team to go to Siberia, Russia. So you can go to the next slide. So now I'm leading this outreach team with three incredible people. One of them was from Korea, one of them was from Paraguay, and one of them was from um, Switzerland. So we are literally the most diverse outreach team that you could get, and it was phenomenal. This is the little boat that we were on, and this was our strategy. Go from the top of the Arctic Circle all the way down all of Russia to the bottom. In the one month that it's, this river is not frozen, and have care packages where we go in and we give things like flour, reindeer meat, coffee, tea, if you're caught up on the reindeer meat, my wife actually thought I was lying when I told her we gave reindeer meat. She's like, reindeer aren't real. And I'm like, no, reindeer are real. They just don't fly, but they're definitely real. And we definitely ate canned reindeer meat every day. So we would go with this care package because a great way to be able to engage with people in the gospel is to bring them a free gift and saying, we see your practical needs and from a place of relationship, if it leads to it, we'd love to share about why we're here and we could share about Jesus freely. So as we're going on this trip, we come to this village, the very first one, and we'd literally take that boat and we would see a house. There was no running water, no electricity, and we'd take our little boat, we'd ram it into the shoreline, we'd jump out, and we'd go in and we'd try to find anybody that we could talk to. 
So this first little stop that we end up going to, some of the most remote places, a lot of these people still practice and sacrificing and, um, and are pagans. And so we go in and we find this first little village and, and uh, every, all the men are out fishing. And uh, so we're like, dang, there's nobody here. And we end up running into this one old lady and uh, we start sharing with her and we give her this care package. And I said, hey, can I play you this song on the guitar? And she's like, yeah. So I play her this song by Phil Wickham called This is the Start of Something Amazing, A Moment When Heaven Touches Earth. It was kind of the song that I sung as we went everywhere because it's true. Uh, this is something amazing, a moment when heaven touches earth. Here in our hearts, Lord, we're waiting for something that is far beyond what you have seen or heard. And it was this kind of this thing where we wanted to, I wanted to sing out this, this thing of expectancy. And I remember as I'm singing it, she's like, yeah, this is great. And then she looks over at her translator and goes, I have no idea what he's saying. It was awesome. That's what happens with language. But still, nonetheless, the spirit moves even when language doesn't. And, uh, and so at the very end of that, we said, hey, can we pray for you? And she said, yes, I would love that. And so we prayed for her, and it was an incredible, impactful time. And she started to cry and just got encountered by the Lord in a really rich and fresh way. We continue on our journey. We're going down, we're going down, we're going down, go to all these little villages. We stop off in all these places, and it was phenomenal and amazing. And towards the very end of our trip, we get to a city that's a little bit more um, put together. It has, you know, uh, electricity and some other things. And we go to this house church. And uh, we were just going to share with them and have a dinner. And this house church comprised of three people. And so we go in and we have this phenomenal dinner with these two ladies and the pastor wasn't able to be there. So at the end of this time, we were like, hey, can we pray for you? And they're like, oh, we would love some prayer. And so we said, okay, we'll, we'll do that. So we pray and we're like, what can we pray for? And, and one of the ladies said, could you be praying for my family? I've been praying for years and years that my, my, my family would have an encounter with Jesus. I'm the only one in my entire family who believes in Jesus because we're so afraid that if we give our lives to Jesus, all these bad things will happen because we're pagans and the enemy will come after us. And so everyone's so afraid. But I've been praying that somebody would go and share Jesus with my family. My, we'd love to pray for that. So after that, we started going through photos. You can go to the next photo. We start going through our photos, and we get to this photo, and she just pauses and starts to break down and weep. And she goes, this is my family. This is my, this is my aunt. This village is uh, my whole family. And so it's very rare that I found on this side of heaven we get to see the fruits of our labor, but Jesus had already been answering her prayers for years by sending people who knew Jesus to share to her family. And so we got to see the fruit of our labor while we were there, and it was a phenomenal and incredible time. So after we, I was in Russia, I ended, up going to, um, I ended up going back to Hawaii and going to Australia to get on our medical ship. You can go to the next slide. I'm going to go through a lot of stories kind of quick because I, I, I know I'm going a little late on time, but this is our medical ship, and, and YWAM ships, are, our goal is to reach the most isolated places of the Pacific with healthcare, like eye surgeries for cataracts. Um, dentistry, primary health care, a holistic approach to also share the gospel. And so I ended up going out and I'm on this ship and um, our very first outreach, I was the medical coordinator and I was on there for a year. So funny how full circle things come back that God allowed me to go back into my passion of being in the medical field uh, just in a different way now that I found my identity in him. And so you can go to the next slide. This is inside of our dental clinic. And I remember the first outreach we had, we, had, we were just running dental clinics. And I walked in and we had a seasoned professional dentist on board. He's uh, one of the board directors of dentistry in the entire United States. And we're working on these two dental clinic chairs. And, uh, and I came in and they weren't using the machines that have sucked in and water and the drill. I don't know if you're familiar with those, if you've ever been scarred by the dentist. But uh, those, that's it. So I come in, and I'm like, hey, they're not working. And they're like, yeah, the engineers, you know, these highly, highly professional engineers who work in, in the industry of being on ships, they can fix anything. They, they came in, and, and they're broken, and they won't work. And I'm like, this is literally the worst. Like, we, I want to do so much more than just the simple little things of, you know, maybe just like pulling a cavity or somebody who has a, a cavity in their tooth and just having to pull their tooth. I would love to be able to do more than that. And they're like, yeah, well, our machines are broken. And I was like, well, you know what, guys? God heals people. What if he can heal machines? Why don't we pray? <laughs> I was like, oh, Lord. <laughs> Why don't we pray for this machine and just see what happens? 
They're like, yeah, let's pray. They're like, okay, cool. All right, God, let's, uh, would you heal this machine? Really simple, soft prayer, nothing big or elaborate. And all of a sudden, it starts to work again. And we're like shocked, guys. We're like, this is wild. This is so crazy. So we go over the other one, and it's like fully dead. And we're like, oh, I don't know, man. Let's just see. So we'll just pray again. So we're like, in Jesus' name, heal this machine. Boom, I grab the little water gun, shoot water across the entire room. And we're like, this is wild. So I'm like, okay, God, clearly you want to do more than just pull people's teeth. We want to be able to do the full functions of being able to help people. So then on that back wall, I just kind of go over to the corner, and I'm organizing things, and I see this plug, and I'm like, oh, this is unplugged. This probably should be plugged in. So I, I go to plug it in. I'm like, where does this go? Follow the cable back. Sure enough, it went back to the machine that just shot water across the room. Not only can God heal people, he can heal creation, and he can do it without even being plugged in. God is an incredible God of, of power. And so moving forward, you can go to the next slide. This 17-year-old comes in, and she has these really bad decaying cavities. You can't see this, but in this, the, not the two front teeth, the next beside it, the teeth were completely rotted out, but there were still roots stuck in there. 17 years old, she comes in and says, I just want you to pull out my teeth. There's, um, there's no, hardly any dentists in Papua New Guinea where we were at, and so her only real chance of having some freedom in her pain was just to have all four of her front teeth gone at the age of 17. We said, I don't think that that's what we want to do. So we didn't tell her this, but we just started working on her mouth. And you can go to the next slide. We can completely restore her smile. And you can go to the next slide. You can see us all. We had finished working in the bottom left. That's Joanne Fox, who was our dentist. And this lady got touched by her teeth being able to be forever changed. And at 17, she doesn't now have four teeth missing in her smile. And then we got to pray with her and share about the love of Jesus of why we were there and how important she is to God and is seen and loved by him. Um, it was in this time that I was on the ship that I also met my incredible wife. So that was phenomenal. So you can go to the next slide. This is our first date in Papua New Guinea. Uh, just an awesome time in the northern region of PNG. Um, we met and we fell in love. At that point, I actually had just stepped into being the ship manager. So I was overseeing the entire ship. And um, we met, and uh, we met, and six months later we were married. So praise the Lord. When you know, you know. You just go for it. And um, so it's phenomenal. You can go to the next photo. I have just a couple. There's another one of her. I wish she could be here with you. She's a teacher back in in Kona. She has a massive heart for the the local kid community. So she stepped out of YWAM and is now a teacher uh, in high school and teaches history. You can go to the next slide. There's another one of us. And so we went through this whole journey of after we got married, we went back to Kona and we started leading these discipleship training schools because, again, I had this massive heart to help people understand who they are in Christ and their identity. And, uh, and that's led me then to travel around the world and share and teach in these schools where for three months, every week is a different topic of the foundation of understanding what does it look like to be in relationship with Jesus. You can go to the next slide. This was the most recent place I was in. It was Lebanon. Uh, at a base uh, in Beirut, one street over from where, if you're familiar, a couple years back, that explosion happened on the wharf. And um, this exact building, every single building in downtown, all their windows were completely blown out. But this was the first DTS that was run um, in Beirut. And, uh, and all of the students, there was 13 of them, were all um, Lebanese, Syrian, and people from Jordan. And it was just a phenomenal time to see this engagement with the Middle East to launch that their understanding of the gospel and their, uh, their response to the gospel also can go into the world. It's not just missionaries coming to them, it's them being sent. And, um, and so I've been with YWAM now for 10 years and specifically with YWAM ships for eight of those. And I have a video that we'll kind of end with just so you can have a little bit of an understanding of what does it look like of what I do in the nations um, it's called What Would You Bring? And then I'll pray and we'll be finished. So if we could roll that video. My family and thousands of others live on beautiful islands all across the Pacific Ocean. We are part of a very diverse region with many different languages, communities, and cultures. 
However, we all live with one challenge. We are isolated. You know, the hospitality and welcome of the islands are legendary. You may have seen tourist pictures of these beautiful islands and many places we go are just like that. However, we have learned we don't have to be there very long and you see the devastating effects of isolation that these people live with. They have no way to obtain health care, dental care, vaccinations. So in that kind of situation, something as simple as a fever, a wound, an infection that sets in can become a life-threatening situation. During one of our recent trips to Papua New Guinea, we met a man named Abraham. He lived on an isolated island just north of Medang. He hadn't seen in over 17 years. And because of that, he'd lost his livelihood, he lost hope. His entire village couldn't wait for the YWAM ship to come in. After a simple 30 minute operation, sight returned to his eyes. In addition to Abraham, 10 others that day had their eyesight restored. These ships are creating a way to change thousands of people's lives, and hope is becoming a reality. In the last three years, we have seen over 900 students and volunteers provide more than 150,000 services in 284 villages. We have been invited by many government officials to bring services to their coastlines. It is incredible to see these doors open in partnership with the government. These germs make you sick. And that's what we're going to teach you so you know why you're washing your hands. On the big island of Hawaii, we are positioned in the heart of the Pacific Ocean. From here, we provide a platform for people to be trained, equipped, and engaged in the nations. We know that there are thousands of people in similar situations like Abraham. For people living on these isolated islands, ships aren't just a good idea, they are the only option. I can still remember the first time I saw a blind person see again. And in that moment, it was so much more than their sight being repaired. It was a restoration of their hope. And that's why it's so worth it. It's so worth it. This is the pure gospel. Jesus met people where they were at when he walked this earth centuries ago. He's still doing it today. I want to bring health care. I want to bring encouragement. I want to bring hope. I want to bring restoration. Transformation. Joy. Education. Compassion. Comfort. Change. Love. Truth. Mercy. Hope. Yes, that's a, that's a quick little bit of a video of, of what I do. And if you were to ask me that question, what I would say is I want to bring the truth of identity and relationship with Jesus. So I'll pray and I'll hand it back over to you. Jesus, I'm so thankful for who you are. I'm thankful for this church and for the opportunity to share stories of your faithfulness, God. I'm just so encouraged to know that there's so many in this room that are also been touched and impacted by the faithfulness that you've had in their life. God, I pray that you would just be uh, nudging them with simple reminders of how good you are and how good you've been to them. God, that they have stories of your love as well. Now, what an honor and a privilege it is to be known by you, Jesus, and to be loved by you. And so we just give you the rest of our day. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.